Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone. This is the first event of the Global Drug uh, Demand Reduction uh, Global Dialogue. It's supported by the African Union, Columbia Plan, Colombo Plan, the Inter-American Commission on Drug Abuse, CCAD, and State Department Bureau of Narcotics and Law Enforcement. We're grateful to all of these organizations for sponsoring this webinar and also for their support of the program uh, on which our presentations are based. Our goal in the webinar is to uh, share some ideas on improving uh, drug prevention uh, uh, and treatment, including best practices. We believe several events of this kind uh, this year are in the works and look forward to seeing you. Uh, my name is William Crano, and I'll be presenting uh, first uh, along with uh, Eusebio Alvaro, who, who is the, my other colleague at Claremont, who will be bookending uh, our presentations, all of our presentations. Uh, and we have uh, three former uh, 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 trainees from our program, uh, Patrick Mediag from the PDA of the Philippines, uh, Hang Pham from VTVI and uh, uh, reporter in Vietnam, and Juliana Mejia and Catherine Mora from Nuevos Ramos, uh, the great Augusto uh, uh, Perez's organization in Colombia. So without further ado, let's let's begin. Next. Oh, I'm going to have this. Okay, I have the I have the control now. All right. Let's see if this works. Come on. Okay, here are the issues that we're dealing with. We, we, we deal with mass media and prevention of psychoactive substances. And if you look at the history of our work, uh, of the work in mass media, they have been irregularly successful in prevention of psychotropic substance use. Successful campaigns are of exceptional value. They're cheap, they can reach everyone in the whole, whole community, in the whole country, uh, even very, very... Uh, uh, faraway places, uh, and yet they, uh, they very often fail, and, they, and the, those circumstances are not cheap anymore, they're exceptionally expensive. Failed campaigns, however, in our way of thinking, have almost always ignored evidence of prevention. How do you prevent, how do you persuade people to do something they don't want to do, which is give up drug maybe that they like? And what we're trying to do is to change that so that all of the work that we present in our messages is evidence-based and we know it works. So what we're trying to do is to train our, uh, our, our trainees to build persuasion into their efforts. We call this persuasive prevention. In the Claremont program, what we do is try to teach not just the basics of prevention, persuasive prevention, but rather how to tr change that information into action, how to transform it. It's not theoretical at this point. Now it's you're in the field, what are you gonna do? We believe that we can do this, and we, as you'll see, we, I think we have done it. And what we wanna do is try to bring people in who have a high possibility of success, because once you succeed in this, you have a chance to do it again. Uh, and in that way, create a program, campaigns after campaigns that really make a difference in your countries. So what does the program involve? Uh, rigorous in-class graduate level training at Claremont Graduate University, basically six to seven hours a day. What we try to do, or what we do, is teach three graduate level courses in three weeks. This is our usual courses. This year we're doing this uh, it, on online, uh, virtually. So far, it looks like it's going very well, uh, but the proof is in the pudding, and we'll see how it goes. But I think it's going very well as, uh, up to now. We're about halfway through. Uh, our three in-class courses uh, in the usual training program involves involve introduction to prevention science, theories of prevention, and persuasion applied to prevention. Uh, we examine the theory of uh, theories of, uh, of persuasion typically in one of our later courses and then in the second part of the class develop applications of the theory to prevention issue that is specific and relevant to each individual's country 
concerns are different, obviously, from country to country. Uh, after that three weeks, we have three months of UPC media-based distance training. Our crew here at Claremont wrote the uh, media-based distance training course. Uh, and so we're intimately familiar with it. And that involves three uh, hours of weekly meetings uh, uh, every week for three months. Uh, and with uh, trainees developing their, not just go through the program, but also develop their projects for implementation uh, as soon as they hit the ground. What do I mean by that? I mean, after the three week, three months, they come back to Claremont for a week where they polish the projects, review what we've taught up to that point, review some more. They take a certification test, graduation, and a celebration, usually at the university president's house, which is always fun. Uh, some of the theories we have developed and covered, and not developed, but covered in the past trainings, integrate uh, persuasion and prevention, health leap model, theory of reason action, uh, social cognitive theory, all of the old timers, along with new stuff that we have developed in our own programs. The IF model, uh, we, we put hit hard on gain, gain loss frame approaches. Uh, we talk about vested interest theory and uh, uh, context categorization model that we've developed here. Uh, we talk about it, we're, we're interested in ambivalence because what we find is most of the people we deal with who are on the verge of using a substance or have been doing it have become very ambi are ambivalent about it. How can we make use of that in prevention? Two-step flow of communication, a wildly uh, uh, underused theory. It's been around for 30 years, 40 years, um, and it really is relevant to mass media-based communication and persuasion. Uh, and it's been ignored for since the 40s. Uh, we don't ignore it. Uh, basically, what we try to do is, is translate or make useful the, these theories that we've talked about in terms of application. The problem is, and it's been with us for a, while, a long time, is that our popular theories operate at a very high level. They tell us what to do, but not how to do it. We require, as, as Merton said many years ago, theories of the middle range. That is, okay, how do we take this model, this idea, and move it into practice? The equip model that we talk about and hit on pretty hard uh, highlights the key message features for successful media-based prevention and persuasion. It's flexible enough to be integrated for use in most prevention models, maybe all of them. Uh, and uh, it is based on strong evidence. This is a culmination of 60 years of hard-fought, basic, fundamental research brought into what we think is going to be useful practice. Uh, and as you'll see from our, uh, uh, from our presenters, uh, we're not mistaken. Uh, so what does it mean? What does equip mean? It is an acronym. It means these are the things that you need to worry about when you create a persuasive message. Uh, from, and again, based on years and years, years of study. The first is obvious, it's engage. You have to attract and maintain attention of your audience, so you might as well go home uh, and save your money. Uh, think about how many ads you watch that don't do this. Not just in prevention, but in almost everything else. Uh, question is an expert. This is the Q part of the equip, equip. You need to raise a question in the mind as a receiver about a pro drug attitude. A lot of times we're dealing with the specific group. These are people on the edge, okay, thinking, well, should I try this or shouldn't I? Usually they're younger people. And the question is what you need to do is reinforce that question. Are you sure that this drug is, is okay? You'll usually get an answer to that question. Your, your communication has to do this. Once you get the answer to the question, your job is to undermine that answer, is to destabilize this contrary attitude, contrary meaning pro-drug. And you do that by informing. You provide a plausible replacement of the belief that either exists or that is in process of happening, okay? Uh, that's not very easy to do, uh, but we try to show you how to do that with the final part of the model, which is what we call uh, persuade. Here we provide uh, psychological incentives for agreement with the message. Th that takes the 
a large part of this model. But if you look at ads in prevention and other ads, what you find is that most of them fail in one or on one or many of these factors. You gotta have them all. Can I do this in a 60 second spot? Yeah, you can. It's been done, we've done it, uh, and it works. And it's this way that we try to induce attitude change. Uh, along with that, we try to understand what's going on. Usually when you present a persuasive message, you get resistance, cognitive resistance, counter argumentation, we call it. We try to make resistance as part of our persuasion process difficult, impossible, or unnecessary. We teach you how to do that. We target or tailor the persuasive message to the specific group that we want to deal with. One size fits all doesn't fit anybody. Don't do it. It's a waste of money. And finally, uh, we try to engage parents when dealing with adolescent audience, with young audiences. Parents, as it turns out, are highly credible sources of persuasion, uh, and they want to help. They're not resistant. Uh, young people are, uh, resist like crazy. But uh, if, you, if you move parents into the equation, it really makes a big difference for you. Uh, this is what I want to, uh, my brief introduction. I think I've saved a bit of time for our other speakers. Thank God. Uh, so now you'll hear from our other presenters uh, from the Philippines, Vietnam, and Colombia. This is a wide ranging group. They have different problems in their countries. They're all very talented, well trained, and it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Patrick, uh, who will, from the Philippines, the DEA in the Philippines. And uh, Patrick, it's, uh, it, it's up to you now. You're muted. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Crano. You're welcome. And uh, like always, I always learn something new from you every time you talk. <laughs> so as one of the recipients of uh, the media-based uh, prevention uh, program of Kremlin Graduate University, we at the Philippines were able to apply some of these theories and models in some of our programs, projects, and activities so okay i'm good so uh, however even though we were able to apply it in some of our programs activities and projects but we were not able to apply implement all of them some of them are pending as shown in the screen and the main reason is the current pandemic that we have this uh COVID situation however uh as will be shown in the next slide I will start by presenting to you, I think, the biggest collaboration that we had. Of course, it involved the Philippine government, the U.S. government through the U.S. State Department, Bureau of International Narcotics and uh, Law Enforcement Affairs. And uh, I'm proud to say that our consultant here is uh, no less than Dr. William Crano of Claremont Graduate University. And we were able to also get the services of a, of a service provider. Uh, activations uh, advertising incorporated and a very popular and it also involved a very well-known uh, song composer in our country so it's the pidea anti-drug animated video uh, there's actually two parts the animated part and there's a song here that was composed specific specifically for this video uh, like what dr crano said earlier their programs are prevention program should have a specific target. And here, our specific target audience is the Generation uh, Z. So why them? Because they compose 40% uh, of our population. And uh, in this uh, program, uh, we specifically targeted the resolute non-users. These are the, the part of their demographics who are determined not to use drugs. But in, our, in this uh, campaign, uh, for us, we're trying to encourage them not just be drug free, but be a model to other to their peers. So in this regard, we were able to use uh, the model that uh, Dr. Craner earlier said that is uh, very much unused and underutilized, which is the two-step two flow of communication model. But also when I showed Dr. Craner earlier before in the making of this uh, of this video, he actually told me that you were able to successfully apply the equip model. So going on to the next slide, this uh, this uh, video was actually launched in uh, March 5, 2020, as shown in the video, uh, in the presentation. 
and it was a very successful uh, launch. However, if you look at the date, it was this is only 12 days before the lockdown was declared in our country. So there was actually a the the cascading of this video to the regional offices to the provinces has been uh, hampered. Although we can still do this by using social media, but not everyone in the Philippines has access to social media. That's why we were relying on classrooms wherein uh, we will be showing this through a film showing type of uh, event. However, until now, as I speak, face-to-face -face classes is not yet allowed. So it's been challenging to cascade this, uh, this, uh, this project. So another project that we came up with is a comics. So this is uh, the Drug Free Workplace uh, comics. Uh, the title is Doors of Change. Now, the thing that we did different here is uh, the topic itself is pretty technical. And to have a change of pace in presenting Drug Free Workplace, we actually dramatized its presentation on how to do it by using a comics. But the application there of uh, the theory that we learned in the Claremont Graduate University is uh, how, how we were able to present this. So aside from dramatizing it, we actually focused on the positive side of being a drug-free workplace. So instead of scaring them, scaring our audience that about the negative side effects of being a drug-affected workplace or a drug lifestyle, we focus actually on the positive side, how it is to be uh, drug free. And with this, we were able to use a psychological reactance theory that says that it's difficult to persuade a person if you will be going through the route of a negative, fr negative uh, framing of the message. And also we were able to use that green frame messaging that we also learned in uh, Claremont Graduate University. Uh, I'll be in the next slide, I'll be showing you that uh, the the front page of the comics, it was actually published both in English and the uh, Filipino. Filipino be being the national uh, language and English because uh, most of the uh, Filipinos uh, studied English when they were in, in elementary, high school, and, and college. So we were able to come up with uh, two versions of this comics. But uh, rest assured that this is not the only comics that we produce. We actually produce six, uh, seven stories. But this uh, this one, Doors of Change, is the only one that's fully documented that we're able to use prevention theories and uh, prevention models. Okay, so lastly, this is uh, actually a our project, the one that Dr. Crane was talking about earlier. This was our final, the Philippines' final project uh, in our class way back 2018. And we had a chance to present this with Dr. Crano in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. So the target audience here is the security guards. Why security guards? Because actually there's uh, an estimated half a million, 500,000 security guards in the Philippines as we speak. And with here, we applied the theory of planned behavior by reinforcing their positive attitude toward being drug-free, their the belief and the support of their co-workers in the institutions that they'll be working in and the perceived behavioral control by simply giving them, capacitating them through training on how to have a positive attitude and how to, uh, how to become more, to become more capable of performing a drug-free behavior. So what we did here is, uh, is we actually, is we proposed this to the agency in charge of licensing security guards in our country, and that is the Philippine National Police. So what will happen is for every individual who wants to be a security guard, they need to first to secure a license. And uh, for them to secure a license, they have to undergo uh, this drug, uh, this anti-drug training that we propose. Then after that, whenever they renew it, whenever they renew their license, which is at least every three, which is every three years, then we have, they will have to undergo. So we have the security guards as a captured audience on this one. And the program of instruction that we came up with, applying all the theories and models that we have, was uh, 
already incorporated in their policies. Uh, if, as you see in the presentation on January 9, 2020, the Supervisory Office for Security and Investigation Agencies of the Philippine National Police passed a resolution adop adopting our program of instruction. So I can say that 70% uh, of this program is already in the bag. However, we were supposed to launch this April 16, 2020, but back then it was still, uh, we we're still under hard lockdown. And since uh, the quarantine has been eased, we haven't received any words yet from the Philippine National Police on where to go. So, but still, since it's already a policy, so it's a matter of time when will we start uh, on when we will be starting to implement this but as of now the capital city or the capital region is still under somehow a strict lockdown and both of our headquarters is co-located in this area so we really never had a chance to meet with them and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to present the projects, activities, and programs of the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency. Now I'll be turning you over to my classmate, Ms. Hang from Vietnam. Hang, it's all yours. Uh, you're muted, Hang. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Hang Pham, I'm from Vietnam, so uh, um, I'm one of the three uh, you know, people who attended the class uh, in, at Claremont University on advanced media-based uh, preventions on psychoactive substance. So uh, let me just walk you through what we've done so far and what we're planning to do. So next slide. So first, let me talk about the triangle uh, execution points. Uh, so these are the three focuses that uh, our team Vietnam have been trying to do in terms of um, media prevention for psychoactive substance. So we really think that um, advocating for law and policies uh, for like drug use prevention is very important as we um, are in the capital city of Hanoi. We have a lot of very uh, close relations with the government. So we so far have been really pushing a lot for law, law and uh, policy advocacy for uh, drugs prevention. And we have been doing a lot of media training after our uh, <clears throat> training at the Claremont University and taking what we learned from uh, Claremont Graduate University to train our trainers. And uh, we also been taking uh, what we learned from the equip model to create new prevention messages. So these are the three uh, focuses that we've been doing so far uh, regarding um, drug use uh, preventions. So next slide. Okay, so uh, let's just take you to last year, 2020. Uh, it's been a really tough year with the pandemic, but um, what we've been focusing is that we have contributed to the discussions uh, at the National Assembly um, on the law on drugs and prevention and control. So just to give you, um, just to clear, give you a, a clear pictures on this. Uh, currently, we are changing the law on drugs and preventions and control. As in this law uh, was last amended back in 2008. So so far, it has been about 12, 12 years that we haven't changed this law. So there's a lot of new things that we need to put into this new law, especially regarding, you know, we need to put a more clear definitions of what is drug prevention intervention in this law. And also we need to advocate for a chapter of prevention plan in this law. So that's what we've been doing. We've been trying to meet with uh, law regulators and um, talk to reporters and also try to advocate so that we can have a a clear and a really thorough comprehensive chapter of preventions in this sort of law. And also in 2020, we have organized uh, student dialogue workshops. So uh, what it is, is that uh, we have officers from the Department of Drugs and Social and Vices Prevention and Control. So this department is uh, part of the Ministries of Labor and, um, and Social Affairs. So these officers will come into um, some <clears throat> we'll invite 300 to 400 students 
into a workshops and we'll talk about like uh, drugs and preventions and what is demand reductions. So that's what we did, did. And then another activity in 2020. Next. Um, and also in 2020, um, <clears throat> what we wanted to uh, what we did was uh, we are drafting surveys and we these surveys will be sent out to uh, adolescents and uh, high school students into in order to learn uh, a better pictures of drug knowledge among uh, these young people because actually in Vietnam now we don't have any data or statistics on uh, how young people know about drugs what we know in the past is that we know about heroin but we don't know about those like new generations of drugs like methamphetamine uh, and things like that and so uh, by giving out uh, these surveys uh, we will learn where they are in terms of knowing about uh, these drugs and how addictive they are and so that's uh, the surveys that we've been trying to draft and also last year we um, we as in like our team of three people we are drafting a project called social media based preventions and in this mm, social media based prevention we have uh, our target audience our students from 13 to 20 years old and also parents and teachers from 25 to 30 years old because this is a social media based prevention. Uh, we are um, considering using Facebook, YouTube and TikTok uh, to, uh, tar to uh, send out a prevention messages to our target audience. Uh, we still think that we have to use traditional media um, because you know traditional media is still really big in, in, in Vietnam and we parents still read it, uh, young people might not use um, like traditional media, not read newspaper or not read the mainstream um, TV, but like uh, parents generation they still do and so we still need to do a lot of preventions on traditional media. And our prevention messages that we are trying at the moment are like don't try even once, Thing before you start or hide in your own healthy way. And also in 2020, what uh, we are thinking of doing is that we uh, will want to coordinate with uh, singers to compose a catchy songs uh, on drugs prevention. This is sort of something that we, um, we think it kind of similar to what uh, our colleagues uh, in the Philippines has been trying to do, you know, uh, if we do it <laughs> with a song, so it's more catchy. So I uh, put in here a, uh, an image of uh, uh, this guy in yellow, so he's like dancing a song uh, which is about um, like cleaning your hands and with a really fun, like fun moves. And so this song has gone viral during the pandemic because it just basically tells you, you know, you need to wear your mask and like clean your hand. It has gone viral and it has uh, been going on um, even like last week tonight show uh, with John Oliver. So we're thinking of coordinating with the same singers because he's like really famous for this kind of stuff. And so maybe he could help us composing uh, catchy songs on drug preventions. Yeah, next. Okay, and uh, so this is what we're planning to do on 2021. Uh, as you understood that uh, we, uh, yeah, everything got drawn to a halt back in 2020 because of the pandemic. Uh, so what we're planning on doing, right, is, uh, probably maybe by March or April is that uh, we plan to organize a seminar on uh, the amended law on drugs and prevention and control, as I said. And so here I also include the photos of um, the seminar, which we did before, so you can have uh, an understanding how to grab of like what a seminar looks like. So this is, um, these two photos are uh, uh, photos from a seminar that we organized in October 2018 upon our um, you know, trip, uh, our like training back at the Claremont Graduate University. So uh, we organized this uh, seminar at the National University and in this seminar we had organizers, uh, uh, we had people from the government office of Vietnam coming in, the National 
uh, assembly office coming in, the representative of the ministries of information and communica communications uh, coming in to talk in our seminar. So we have done this kind of seminar before. So we're thinking of doing it again, uh, probably in April or in May. Uh, and we have talked to some of our sponsors, uh, that's Facebook and UNESCO, and they're really willing to uh, sponsor this kind of seminar so that we can uh, talk more and maybe like advocate, advocating on having a chapter of preventions on the amended law on drugs preventions and control. Yeah, and so uh, also in 2021, we decided that we will coordinate it with uh, VTV1, uh, where I work. It's a state TV uh, state TV stations. We'll run a feature TV of 15 minutes. And also in this show, we will talk more about like definitions of like drugs preventions and just give an idea. And so we can do more of like law advocacy. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Yeah, as I said, uh, in uh, 2020, we have finished uh, drafting uh, surveys to our students. And so in 2021, we what we hope to do is we will distribute a survey of uh, drugs prevention knowledge to students. So we we'll probably pick about like three or four um, high schools uh, and to hand out these and maybe some universities uh, because, you know, these are also like the, the age uh, which you know, very prone to like uh, drug use. And so we're, we'll distribute our surveys to them and just to see like where they are in terms of knowing about drugs, uh, new generation drugs and are they addictive or not? Those kind of things that we, we will try to uh, have our surveys uh, get out to them. Um, and because we're already finished uh, our social uh, social base uh, media prevention. So we in 2021 we will implement this social media based prevention plans, and that will include like fundraising and executing this plan. And uh, we have to monitor the effect on uh, social media based preventions on these platforms. And one of the things that we why we pick um, social media based like Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok is because that it's um, it has it has an advantage because we can know how many people actually uh, listen to one video uh, or comment on one uh, video. So there's a lot of interactions going on if we do social media based preventions. And we really we will uh, know exactly for sure like uh, whether our plan uh, has been successful or not. Uh, you know how many people they have rich and what are some of the feedbacks. Uh, you know people can co can comment on us on the um, uh, prevention messages, they can tell us whether they feel like they being persuaded or not. And so, and in 2021, we would still like to continue with our student dialogue workshops. So as I said, uh, our officers will be coming in, uh, talk to the students about uh, drugs, what it uh, effects it can have on our uh, brains, and so the, to talk more with the students. So, so three, we are expecting also like 300 to 400 students to come in these workshops to listen to these officers. And so that's what we will still be doing yeah, this year. And this is also, and next one is that we're planning to do a, like a fun run race to increase the awareness on drugs prevention and control. Uh, so far, like these kind of fun run has been very popular in big city like Hanoi, where I am living right now, which is also the capital city. And people have been, so like back in 2020, although we still have the pandemic, but I believe we have about like 15 to 20 uh, marathon race. Uh, organized so it was still a really uh, huge thing that like people have been you know with the pandemic people actually becoming more and more aware of their health doing more running and so we would really hope to organize uh, a fun run race uh, in 2021 and what we're thinking of uh, putting uh, prevention messages on these fun run race is that you know uh, high in your own healthy way like put it right 
over here on your shirt or like choose or the mess another message could be like choose your hive wisely uh, just to explain to you guys a little bit about this uh, why i uh, picked this uh, prevention messages is because you know like when you run um like a runner uh, you reach to a point that you feel like you, you run too much you get a uh, really high and so it's like really a healthy kind of high that you can get you know by like running um like really <laughs> run, run running and so that's why i i think we i kind of play with words here when i uh, you know when I, we put in these prevention messages so uh, it could be a really fun run race to increase awareness yeah next slide okay next slide please okay um so train the trainers uh, we train the trainer will still be a really big thing in 2021 uh, uh, this year and we're hoping to do more media training uh, and where we invite uh, participants like tv and print and e-newspaper and e-magazine reporters to uh, come and join us in these kind of workshops and talk to them more about uh, the equip model and all the theories that we have learned at the uh, Claremont Graduate University and so because uh, the reporter, the journalist can only write a persuasive message, can only report a story that is persuasive if they have uh, know more about like these uh, kind of theory and uh, they know like they get real facts about like drugs. And so um, yeah, the content will be like just some basic knowledge and preventions some uh, how to create a prevention a prevention message with an equip model we're thinking of uh, if we can have a lecture um, lecturer come in dr crano will come in and help us to uh, train the trainers uh, in this uh, sort of uh, program uh, or we can also do a zoom uh, training in with the media training so that's uh, one also another program that we're aiming that we're going to do in 2021, uh, probably the, like the end of this year. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, yeah, so that's uh, probably that's it. That's what we, our team Vietnam uh, have done in uh, 2020 and what we're hoping to do uh, this year. So uh, thank you for listening. And now let's just pass on to Juliana in uh, Colombia. So thank you, Hank. Uh, yes, I'm with my colleague, Catherine Mora. We work in Corporación Nuevos Rumbos in Colombia, and we are going to present uh, our media campaign called Less is More regarding alcohol consumption. Um, and we're going to present how to how using the theory of plan behavior of plan behavior, the equip model, uh, the gain and loss frames, uh, how can we persuade some people of a project called Escala, uh, funded by the European Union, to decrease the heavy drinking and alcohol consumption in three countries, in Mexico, Peru, and Colombia. Um, next, please. Well, um, Sorry, cannot see it. Well, based on the global status report on alcohol and health, we can see that the alcohol per capita consumption is not as high as in other parts in the in the world. But uh, because we because we see that, for instance, in Colombia we have the consumption of 5.8 liters of alcohol consumption per year, but we see that we have a high prevalence of alcohol use disorders, in especially in Peru and Colombia, because in Colombia we have 7% and in Peru we have 8.9%, which are the highest rates in Latin America and for instance in Colombia we have uh, the uh, high uh, the second high rate on alcohol dependence with 3.2 percent uh, also the deaths related to alcohol abuse have been increasing in this in our in our uh, countries in Latin America, for instance. Next, please. Uh, then we see that this is very important. This, this is a, a problem that we have to, to deal with. 
then uh, the project is very important for this for this um, population. The target audience is the is the people who um, sorry okay the target audience is the people who oh, sorry the sound is is <laughs> Disgusting. Well, the target audience is people who live in Suacha. Suacha is a town. It's a town very close to Bogota, which is the capital of Colombia, and uh, they are part of the project because the project, the Scala project, is uh, in the primary healthcare centers of the hospital of this town. Then they are the main attendees and the patients of our doctors who deliver a screening and brief advice and referral if needed. Uh, Suacha is a population very particular because uh, the formal records say that uh, they, they have 500,000 people, but the informal records, uh, we can see that there are one and a half million people because of migrant population, especially from Venezuela, and uh, people displaced by the violence of the country, of the, of the same country. Uh, next, please. Um, we have, uh, as usual, more females than males. We have 51% uh, females than males, the 49. Um, the, for the project, for the media campaign, we decided to divide the population who request services at the hospital of Soacha. Uh, we divided this population into four subpopulations, young adults, from 18 to 26, adults from 27 to 35 years of age, in the medium range, adults from 36 to 59, uh, and elders uh, from 60 and more, because we have to divide the channels that we are using in this, in this, with this population. Um, then uh, there are different channels that we are going to see later, later, a little bit later. Um, could you go? I think that you have to do in the previous slide. And the on the previous, the previous, previous. Well, using this a theory, the quick model, and the persuasive strategy, we uh, the, the first thing that we did was to think what was the theory that was fitting that, that that fits better with the with the aims of the project. And the aims of the project is increasing the assistance of the attendance of the patients to the primary healthcare centers to talk about alcohol. And um, because this particular population is very particular, as I told you, because they have two characteristics very important. The first one is that the culture of alcohol is very um, is embedded into the culture. Then the, the, they drink a lot during the, people in Colombia drink a lot during the weekend, but not at all during the week. And then they think that this is very normal. And, and then they avoid every comments about alcohol consumption, about the that they are abusing of alcohol, even if they only drink once per week, but they drink everything, uh, a, a, a bottle, a complete bottle. And the other characteristic uh, that was very challenging was that some patients are illiterate, then they don't know, they can't read or uh, write. Uh, Olivia, I think that you can put the uh, slide in the land behavior theory. Thank you. Mm, well, the first thing that we did was uh, to use the theory, this theory, because we think that it fits very, it fits very well with the uh, with the goals. And then, if we change attitudes, objective norms, perceived behavioral control, we can change the intentions of drinking to, to decrease for low risk alcohol consumption in the population, and of course, change the behavior. Then, in the next slide. Uh, well, okay, no, no, no problem. Um, we'll see how this, what are these attitudes that we want to change. Uh, then we want to change for the positive attitudes to our receiving information about alcohol risks because the two goals that we plan to change with the media campaign was increasing the attendance at the primary health center and to be open to receive information uh, from the doctors and increasing alcohol health literacy. Then the people, uh, know that they can drink responsibly uh, and limiting the number of drinks per occasion then from two standard drinks uh, to maximum ma maximum two standard drinks maximum four uh, drinks maximum maximum four days per week 
Well, um, I think that Catherine could continue with the persuasive strategy. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Catherine. Uh, like Juliana said, we are using the theory of plan behavior, but also we are using a few persuasive strategies. The first one is gain and loss frame, like Dr. Crane said before. So this strategy works telling people how the um, how they can gain or what they can gain uh, if they perform some kind of behavior. So, and also we are using the um, equip model that is this one on uh, that has it has uh, five components. Uh, the first one is attract people's attention about our issue, um, heavy drinking in this case or. Um, alcohol use. So we want to raise a question to um, people's minds and try to change that positive attitude that they already uh, have about uh, heavy drinking or, or drinking a lot during weekends, for example, and providing a replacement of this existing belief to another, a health one in this case. Uh, we want to persuade them and show them that our, our message, um, it has a, a good benefit for, for them. So in the first case, um, Olivia, if you can put the slide with the first poster, we designed um, our messages, put it on uh, posters, uh, videos at the waiting rooms, um, and also radio ads. So for uh, the first example that we have um, here in the um, slide, slide with the first poster, uh, we, we have this message based on gain and loss frame, and this works easy here. People can save money, in this case, reducing the number of drinks to two per day or four per occasion in the maximum way. So that message say that it, it has some the um, iconic message that we have in our campaign that is less, uh, less is more or in alcohol, uh, less is more. So as well, we have our project logo here that is uh, well recognized uh, at the for the medical staff and our population too. So also we have the, our contact information down there to, to let them know about us and the project too. And down there we have the partners. Of course, the hospital is the most recognized uh, in our community. That is Swatch in this case. For um, uh, the second example, um, we are working with the equip model. So the second one, the, the next slide, Please, Olivia. So we fear first here we are trying to um, reminding reminding people about the comorbidity to those problems in this case, memory and sleeping trouble, and how these those problems are related with heavy drinking or alcohol reuse. So uh, we are trying to use a easy language uh, for the for, for our population and raise a question on people's mind about um, the need to the need to check their health and talk with with the with the doctor about their alcohol use so and also they can uh, get a recommendations or a way to quit heavy drinking or in other uh, other case uh, reduce uh, alcohol use so we are trying to change the way that the people see alcohol drinking to a behavior that has already risk us on so it is not a completely safe behavior so we're trying to inform too and change change that idea to a healthy one and tell them what is the way to to do it of course the idea here is let them know if if they change their, their lifestyles and to a um, healthy way to drink and reduce those problems so uh, they can be um, better so uh, everything around them can be are good for them so uh, also for for those messages we use uh, or we divide our messages having in count the group of population that we have in this case so for the next slides uh, we are using channels so for the young adults and intermediate adults we are using social media putting those posters the videos and their radio ad but in a uh, Visual, visual way. So those uh, messages are working on right now in those channels. And the, for, for the elders, the elders, we are using uh, videos of the way because they, they are the most people, the most common people are the at each primary healthcare center. So uh, we think that we think the radio ads and uh, th those ways works uh, really uh, well for for them for attract them. So in the next slide, we are going to see. 
um, the example of a video that it works in a, uh, at the waiting room. So for those videos, we use our medical staff giving recommendations about how to drink in a healthy way, but also reminding people that alcohol is not a completely, completely safe behavior. So the power of our message messages here is basically that the, that the who is present the messages. So here we have the expert. This is a, a young a doctor that is uh, well recognized in the community. So that's worked really well for the population. So for now we have uh, ten posters, eight videos, and one radio that is working on the community all the time. So for this process. process. So um, at this point, you know how we design our campaign, how it's uh, evidence-based, uh, how we apply the theory that we learned at CGU, um, and for for all those uh, components, uh, we already planned um, evaluation. So design in a quasi based on quasi experimental designs. That basically says that we had two groups. The first one that is Swacha that we are working with right now. That we talking about it and the control one so the experimental one now is receiving all those messages all those posters those videos and everything so the second one is not going to receive our campaign so we want to compare how uh, this works for the uh, experimental control and the um, and for the experimental one and the control one so here uh, we, did, we already did a pilot testing to verify if those materials that were received to to the population, to the um, medical staff, and of course, uh, Nuevos Rumbos Corporation team, of course. So for for about that, we received uh, feedback, and we already did the fix on all the, of those messages to uh, do a really match with the theory. So, and for our um, evaluation plan, we're going to do surveys uh, before the patients meet the doctor. So in here, we want to know the likelihood uh, of to go and talk with the doctor about their alcohol use, if they are exposed to our or for our campaign, or if they uh, are not exposed to our campaign. So that's the idea of those go the two groups. So basically, that's our how our campaign works. That's the way that we are measuring. And for now, uh, we are. Uh, some of some of our plans uh, changed for the for the coronavirus and everything for the pandemic. So now we are doing just a post test in each group. For in the first case, we thought that maybe a pre and post test it will be better. But for now, we are doing just a post test in each group, and we think that, that that's possible for now in our communities and in each uh, primary healthcare center. So that's the that's the way that our media campaign works. We think that works well and fits with the Scala project. And thank you to everyone for your attention. And thank you, Dr. Crane, for all the knowledge that you gave to us. And thank you, everyone, for your attention. All right. Uh, thank you all for a wonderful series of presentations. I, I am going to limit my remarks uh, to uh, uh, just a, a few minutes here to off the top and basically uh, we will have perhaps a little bit of time for if uh, people have some questions uh, before before we go. Um, I guess the, the major point I, I wanted to make, uh, besides the fact that this is like a, just a great set of of, of, of of samples here in terms of the, the sample interventions that we want to look at, um, is is this idea that uh, just the breadth of the types of interventions involved. Uh, we you see they're very different even within within countries we have some very different projects targeting very different audiences and also using very different approaches like when we, tip, we typically when we think of prevention um, we are we kind of assume uh, that we're targeting individuals to, in order to prevent them from going on to to, to use substances or misuse, any misuse substances um, you can see here, though, that we can't expand from that, right? So we have advocacy uh, uh, kind of campaigns where we're actually targeting policymakers as, as an audience, right? They're, they're not, we're not targeting their use, but we're targeting them to implement policies and laws that will then influence use behaviors, right? Uh, we're also they also have projects, for example, Patrick's project out of the Philippines, where you're targeting security guards, 
uh, as, as one element, right? So you kind of, not, again, not look, looking at their own use as well, but also they are, can be change agents in their communities that they now are educated uh, about these issues and they, they obviously interact with the population and kind of pass on the information. Uh, in Colombia, we're targeting people, uh, patients at a clinic directly. Uh, we're, they're also targeting uh, people out in the community and motivating to go seek help at these clinics. All right, so we have a wide range of audiences, a wide range of approaches, and I, want, I, I think that's really encouraging, and I would encourage everybody out there to kind of think about uh, not just going directly at your target audience in terms of trying to prevent them from using, but also uh, uh, how can you motivate change more broadly in your society, uh, among your healthcare providers, among your educators, uh, at, that, at those kinds of broad levels. And I think that, that we, they do a really good job here, which is our trainees, uh, of kind of covering uh, all of those different bases. I think the next major point is the, the importance of a theoretical base. Uh, I think Dr. Crano had mentioned that, you know, we, we, we had a list of theories there that we cover. A lot of those theories are familiar to you or can be, should be familiar to you, perhaps, uh, the kind of the traditional behavioral science theories. Others are kind of some forgotten approaches, forgotten theories. Uh, and, and then, we, but I think more, more importantly is, uh, you know, anybody could pick up a book and learn about these different behavioral science theories. I think the unique aspects that these trainees have really taken to heart is, is kind of the equip model and the foundation that we provide in terms of translating these theories to action. Uh, for example, just to take one broad theory, the theory of planned behavior, a lot of you may be familiar with that theory. It's a wonderful theory. We use it ourselves in a lot of work. Uh, and it, you know, it says things like, for example, that you, know, you, you, know, you have to consider people's attitudes as well as their, the subjective norms and perceptions about people around them uh, in, terms of, in terms of dictating their behavior, what they will do. Uh, and so you may have to change their attitude to be more in line. Well, with, with kind of the behavior you want. Well, the theory, the theory is informative about that. Okay, I have to target their attitudes. I have to change their attitudes. It does not tell you how to change an attitude, right? So to learn how to change an attitude, you you need another model, right? You need some more guidance. And so the idea is that the Quip model uh, is one such model that actually teaches you how to change that attitude, right? So the the, the theories, the broad models, help you identify what needs to be, what what you need to intervene with. But what we do in the model is to try to target uh, specific behaviors, specific features of an ad. What should you say? How should you say it? Who should your source be? Right? Those kinds of characteristics. And again, I think that the, the trainees here have done a wonderful job in terms of uh, operationalizing those theoretical constructs, like really kind of going at the heart of it. And unfortunately, you know, we're limited in time, but if you, if you really sat down and talked with these people uh, and, and interacted and, and asked a lot of questions about the specific things that they have in the interventions, you would see all of that come out. You would see the level of detail that's in there. And how that can tell kind of ties back to the very series on the equipment. Um, the other thing I, I think another third and kind of final uh, broad point here is this idea of uh, uh, rigor, uh, rigor in terms of uh, developing these interventions. Uh, not just theoretical rigor, but also there's a, you can see there's a lot of pilot testing going on. There's a lot of formative research. There's thought given to who is your audience, mm -hmm. right? Uh, not only just demographically, uh, so demographics are important in terms of segmenting your audience, different people respond differently to different messages, but also psychographically, right? So we have, uh, for example, in, in, in the Philippines project, uh, the, there's some targeting of people who are both, uh, they're all targeting of non-users, non-using youth. But not all non-using youth are the same. You have some non-using youth that are very resolute. They'll, they'll never going to use. They're adamant. They're never going to use. You have other youth that are not so adamant. They're a little bit more flexible. They may be a little bit more open to use. Right now, they're, those, both those populations are non-users. But they're not going to respond the same to the same message because their perspective, how they interpret messages, is going to be uh, different. And so again, we have uh, these projects taking that into, that, that into account. Uh, Understanding that in Vietnam, they're doing the survey, right, to kind of see where kids are at, what their attitudes currently are, what the knowledge base is currently at. Uh, you know, you have in Colombia, they've done a lot of pilot tests and they've done some focus groups with, with, the, with the target audience trying to find messages that, that, that resonate. Uh, and so, I th again, I think from, from start to finish and even to the evaluation phase, right, kind of the built in sense of is what we're doing working, right, and did it work as we thought it would work? 
uh, uh, was there fidelity? Was, was the intervention inter in implemented as it was planned? Uh, so I, I, I like the full package in terms of this, there's a lot here from start to finish. Uh, and I would encourage you to kind of reach out to our, our trainees, uh, this group and, and, and others, if you want to connect with us, we could also kind of connect you uh, with other trainees we've trained across the world. Uh, and we can also uh, we'd be very happy to also offer any assistance that we can, both Dr. Crane and myself, uh, uh, our emails are down there. Uh, so please feel free to contact if you have any concerns, uh, questions, uh, would like further information. And thank you very much uh, for, your, for your kind attention. Uh, and uh, please join me in congratulating our attendees. And if, if, if there are any questions, I could, we could handle some of those at this point. Uh, uh, but I don't see any currently, so perhaps uh, we're at a point. Right. Well, thank you all for showing up, for coming. There were 400 and some odd, not odd, but uh, people uh, <laughs> watching today. And uh, I want to thank our panelists for really doing a bang up job. You, you've, uh, you've really done a wonderful job. Uh, made wonderful use of what you've learned and and I and what that means is that you're going to have an impact uh, which is what we're after you're going to have an impact on the on the communities that you serve in and that is an important and, and necessary part of the part of the work and it's what we try to do it's why you were chosen for the program partly it's because you're smart and people nominated you and as being well trained and being in the right position to do something and we chose people not just uh, on the basis of being able to learn something but to be in positions where they could actually make it happen and that's what we tried to do so thanks again to all of you for for coming thanks to our sponsors for uh, for allowing this um, and uh, and thanks for the continued support that we have received. So we're signing off now. Uh, thanks again, and have a good day. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you.